Okay, it's up. I've turned the microphone on. Good. Step one, tick. Okay, so thank you all for coming to this session, which was put together, um, I think, as most of you know, at relatively short notice. I've been having a really good time. This has been this is my first time at ACU. It's been, everyone's been really lovely, so it's really nice to be able to come and give something back. And we spent a lot of time over the last two days sort of talking about very technical topics. There's a lot of stuff about very low-level internals, very technical talks, and that's a really good thing. I've really enjoyed that. But we have to recognize that our technology doesn't exist in isolation. And so Gail invited me to come and sort of give this presentation, which is a stripped-down version of a presentation I've given before, about some of the times when our technology, our software, actually get, gets used, when the rubber meets the road. Another thing I've noticed over the last two days is we talk a lot about things that we have to be thinking about all the time. Things like security, performance, maintainability. Things we can't just add retrospectively at the, at, at the very end of the process. And so I want to talk in this session about one of those other things, something I think is another really important thing to think about. And that thing is safety. Now, I don't mean safety in a technical sense, like type safety or memory safety or safety from cosmic rays. I'm talking about user safety, the safety of the people who actually use our software. So this is a brief talk to start getting you all thinking about issues of harassment, abuse, user safety, and some of the things you might need to think about. Before we start, though, I need to give a few content warnings. This is a talk about harassment. It's a talk about abuse. So we're going to talk about both those things. There'll be mentions of both of those, heavy mentions of both of those. Brief mentions of racism, misogyny, sexism, suicide, rape, death threats, various lovely things that happen on the internet. If any of those things make you uncomfortable and you would like to step out for a few moments, catch your breath, get a drink, I will absolutely not be offended. Please feel free to step away if any of this makes you uncomfortable. So we're talking about safety today. We're talking about the ways that, so and we're talking about the ways that software can be used for harm. So let's start by looking at an example. This is an app called Square Cash. It's a mobile app. It allows you to send money to people, peer-to-peer -peer transactions. And one of the really nice things it includes, as opposed to your regular bank, is it's got this nice little chat feature. So somebody can send me a message asking me to send them some money, and I can send them some money and include a message telling them what I'm paying for. Really useful contextual information, much nicer than that sort of eight-character reference you get if you do it through online banking. What they didn't really think about when they built this is that this is a messaging platform. And yes, you can enter messages that tell people that you're sending them money, or you can enter any other message at all. And so there's a tweet that went viral a while back. A friend's abusive ex has been sending her a dollar on Square Cash regularly for months because he can send her a message and she can't block that. Because the developers of this app never thought about the fact that why would you want to block somebody? After all, I like receiving money. You all like receiving money. Everybody likes receiving money. Who would want to stop somebody sending them money? Well, to, to be fair, now to be fair to Square Cash, when this tweet went viral, they were very proactive. They were very fast about it. They added a block function within about two weeks, but it still took this go, this blowing up, for them to think about it, for them to put in that feature. Um, and in the same way, you probably wouldn't want to find out about a massive security vulnerability in your application because it's the top result on Hacker News. You probably don't want to find out about safety issues through viral tweets. So the general message, the underlying message of this talk is that this can't just be something we think about when it goes wrong. User safety can't be an afterthought. It has to be something we think about as we're building our software, as we're building our services. Because the truth is, I think, most developers don't mean well. We are not setting out to build services to enable harm, to enable harassment. If you are, please examine your life choices. The Square Cash developers wanted to build a better way to do mobile payments. They wanted to build a better way to do peer-to-peer -peer transactions. They didn't want to build a way to enable somebody's ex to harass them. But the sad truth is, if we have software that allows user-to-user -user interactions, which is a vast body of software, we have the possibility of harassment. Because there are some terrible people in the world, and they will do terrible things with our software. So what does harassment look like? Let's, look at a few, let's briefly look at a few examples. It could be sending nasty messages. And this ranges from the relatively innocent, spam selling us dubious medical products, phishing, trying to steal our passwords. It can get personal, bullying, all the way up to 
unsolicited sexual or pornographic content, or even explicit rape and death threats. And all these are very unpleasant things to find in your inbox. It could be posting of personal information, doxing, posting someone's address on the internet, which puts them at risk. You could be outing an LGBTQ plus person without their consent, that can put them in danger. Uh, a particularly insidious practice recently has been swatting. In the US, you call up the police, you claim that you call in a hoax threat, they send armed police around to somebody's house, and someone wakes up at 2 a.m. in the morning to discover armed police on their doorstep. It could be sharing intimate photos without permission, uh, so-called revenge porn, grooming of young people, identity theft, exclusionary behavior, trying to keep people out of a group, dog piling, where a large crowd piles on one person, and lots of other things that I didn't want to put on this slide because there are quite a lot of them, and it's all fairly unpleasant. But you are all mostly familiar with this, I imagine, vaguely familiar with this sort of behavior. And one of the things that... But harassment is not new. Harassment did not begin with the invention of the silicon microprocessor. Humans have been harassing other humans for years because fundamentally there are just, will always be, some terrible people. What's changed with the internet and technology and modern technology is the scale and the scope of harassment. Because previously, if I wanted to send this to somebody, I had to get a piece of dead tree, put some ink on it, put that in another piece of folded dead tree, put a stamp on it, put that in a post box, and then the postman would take it to them. Now, I can harass somebody halfway around the world at the push of a button. And I can do it much faster and much easier and on a scale that was never possible before. And because technology evolves so quickly, it enables new threats. Um, take, for example, revenge porn, right? Sharing intimate photos without permission. This is possible because in the 21st century, we all have cameras in our pockets. In fact, I, let's get, I would guess probably I have at least one, two, three, four. I have at least four cameras just in front of me. There are probably at least 100 cameras in this room. That enables the widespread sharing of photographs in a way that simply wasn't possible before. And that's fantastic. That's really convenient. But it opens new vectors for abuse. It opens new vectors for harassment. So digital technology, the internet, has enabled, has enabled a scope and scale of harassment that simply wasn't possible in the past. So that's what we need to worry about. I want to add here as well, um, certainly when I was younger, and I think still to some extent today, people used to say, oh, but this is just words on the internet. It doesn't matter. It's just words on a screen. You can just ignore it. And I think that if you're somebody who doesn't really have to deal with much of this stuff, it's you only get a small amount, it's not specific, specifically targeted to you, maybe it's easier to it wash off you, maybe it's easier to roll over it. Um, but it's not the case that this is just words on the internet. Um, and I had to learn this in an unfortunate way when I was, much, when I was quite young, a bit younger. Because when I was in school one day, we came in one day and we were told that one of our classmates wasn't coming back. Um, she'd been bullied on Facebook, and the previous day had jumped off a bridge and taken her own life. People in my school stopped, the adults in my school stopped saying that words on the internet didn't matter after that, but I think it, I think it was a bit late for her. So online harassment is unpleasant, it is a thing that happens, and it is a thing that has consequences. Okay, this is not just something that exists on the internet, it's not just something we can ignore. And as software developers, as people who build tools, we are the people who are enabling the tools to allow this harassment to happen. So I think we do bear some responsibility for it. So harassment, it's a multi-headed beast. It's a thing, I think, and it takes many forms. It's a constantly evolving thing. I think it's a thing we need to worry about. So who's doing it? Who is doing all this harassment that I'm talking about, this bullying, these threats, uh, this phishing, that sort of thing? Well, I think we have this popular image of a hacker, don't we? Now we'll see, this person fits all the stock photo hacker stereotypes. They're wearing a hoodie. They're drinking coffee in a darkened basement. They have green text projected on their face. And maybe this sort of anonymous hacker in Russia or China is the sort of person who's port scanning our boxes, or the person who's trying to brute force your S every SSH key on the every SSH instance on the internet. But this isn't the person who's responsible for a lot of online harassment, for, of, often responsible for a lot of online harassment and suddenly some of the worst of it. Online harassment follows a lot of the same patterns, trends we see in harassment in the 
physical world. I was going to say real world, but of course, the online world's a real world as well. And we need to be thinking not just about these anonymous, faceless people in a basement in Russia, but also people a lot close to home. Because the sort of people you might be worried about if you're worried about harassment can be things like an abusive partner, an abusive ex, or family members. These are people who are really close to you. They probably have physical access to you. They probably know a lot of your secrets. Quick show of hands in the room. How many people know at least one other person's, say, mobile phone passcode, password, that sort of thing for their computer? So quite a few of you. Now, I'm sure you're all nice people. I'm not seeing nods from everyone in the room, which is a little bit concerning. <laughs> but you can imagine, right, that if you were maliciously minded people, having that information makes you extremely dangerous. You would have access to that person's digital devices, their digital life, their private messages, their support networks, everything. These people are extremely dangerous for your users. Now, who else is it? Classmates, kids, as we've seen, can be terrible. Also, co-workers and ex-co-workers. I think we don't, often don't think about the risk of the people we interact with, but that could be a problem, particularly maybe somebody who got let go in a redundancy or who got, prom or who got promoted. You got promoted instead of them. Co-workers and hold grudges, friends and ex-friends. Um, that one date weirdo. This is another one that the internet has enabled for us that we never really had to worry about in the past. You know, we've all got these online dating sites, lots of people meet people through the internet. That's fantastic, great way to meet people. But if you go on a date with somebody, doesn't really work, you're not feeling it, but they, but they did, they're upset, they've now got a whole, tool, a whole collection of tools and information that they can use to find you, to track you, to harass you. So we need to worry about these people as well. Rogue sysadmins as well. What, this, what are the sysadmins doing with your production data? and oppressive regimes, although hope, you know, in this country, most of us, we're fairly lucky not to have to deal with the government breathing, breathing down our necks, but there are certainly countries in the world where that's more of an issue. Um, you know, certain countries, the countries that have perhaps more, regret, more, regret, more repressive laws where we may have users who are at risk. But the thing you'll notice about most of these people is that they are not anonymous, faceless people sitting in a basement in Russia. These are people that our users know. They're people who are close to them. They're people who might even have physical access to them. Because the sad truth is, people are more likely to be hurt by people they know. The vast majority, a lot of harassment, domestic harassment, and so on, occurs with people, with people we already know. Lots of, people, lots of murder victims knew their murderer. This is a pattern that plays out in physical harassment. It's a pattern that plays out in online and digital harassment as well. So when we're doing our analysis, when we're trying to work out how we protect people from harassment, these are the people we need to be worrying about. These are the, these are the malicious actors who we need to be thinking about and thinking about what they might be doing. So that lays out some of the scope of the problem. There are lots of bad people in the world, and they do lots of bad things. I hope I've, I've sufficiently improved your mood, mood during the conference. So how do we make it better? How can we... If we know that there are these bad people and they're doing bad things, and we are creating the platforms and services that allow a lot of this to happen, what can we do to change that? What are the things we can do to make it better? I would love to be standing before you with some sort of silver bullet, with some sort of perfect solution that makes everything better, uh, but if I had such a thing, I would not be here. I would be in the Bahamas, you know, living a life of luxury. It's unfortunately not that simple. But there are steps we can take, there are things we can do to make services safer, to make the, to make the world a better place for those users, of our, for our users who might be at more risk, who might be more vulnerable. And something I think that's really important to emphasize is that making your software better for vulnerable users can make it better for everyone. This is not just a case of we're gonna fix it for the 1% of users who are the victims of harassment or whatever it is, or the people who have abusive exes. By adding good controls, by making our services better, it benefits everybody. And so one example of this, let's think about spam email. Now, how many spam emails do most of you get a day? I, I, look at my, I looked at my inbox today. I had three spam emails in the last 24 hours. I can deal with three spam emails. I can delete those manually. But there are people who are more important and more in the public eye than me, and they get thousands of emails a day. They can't manage that themselves, so we build spam filters. We build spam filtering technology that enables people to automatically deal with their spam. 
And so I didn't actually have to delete those three spam emails. Mainly they were classified and deleted for, they were classified and filtered out for me. Even though I'm not a victim of, of you know, heavy spamming, I still get to benefit from that technology. And this plays out in lots of, lots of ways. So how can you make your software better? How, what are the ways you can make it better? Well, the first most important thing I think you have to do is to diversify your inputs. Okay? We all only have our own singular lived experience, and harassment comes in lots of different ways and affects lots of different people, people differently. If you are not listening to a diversity of experiences, whether that's from the people you hire, or going to conferences and meeting new people, following different people on Twitter, listening to the sort of things they have to say and what their experiences are like, you're not gonna hear the sort of problems they have to face, the sort of things they might have to worry about with your software. And so let's look at one example of this that I imagine some of you might be familiar with. How many of you have used, a so have used Git? Hands up. Good. I, see, I, I can see some people who were in the Git session uh, at, the at the beginning of, uh, who were in the Git talk at the beginning of the session, okay. How many, have used Git, how many of you have used Git in the last 24 hours? Okay, how many of you have used Git since I started speaking? <laughs> I'm disappointed. Okay, Git is, I'm not offended. I'm a little offended. So Git is a fantastic piece of software. It is, in some ways, the original blockchain. Um, I don't, which I don't mean as a joke. Like, actually, that's one of the many. That's one of the benefits of Git, right? And we just heard we just heard a session all about that, about the value of blockchains, because it gives us an immutable history of our code. We have these commit hashes, and these commit hashes are immutable. And if you ever go through and change the history of your, history of your Git code base, that's a destructive operation. It invalidates all the hashes, and somebody can see that. I don't know, the NSA have come in and tampered with your code or something like that. Whatever malicious thing somebody's doing to your Git history. That's a feature, right? That's a good thing we all accept that's a good feature of Git. What the Git authors didn't think about, though, is what they bake into the immutable history. Obviously, they bake in the date, the commit message, the code, and your name. Now, for most of us, having our name permanently committed to hit, most people having your name committed to the history of repository might not be a problem. But for some people, actually having that old name stick around for time immemorial can be an issue. This predominantly effect might affect, for example, uh, people who go through a messy divorce and perhaps would not prefer not to be professionally associated with the name they had before they were divorced, or trans people who are trying to hunt, or tr who would prefer not to have their birth name published in the repository for anybody to see. But the Git authors didn't think of this. They didn't realize that baking somebody's name permanently into the repository with no way to change it without being very destructive might be an issue. And I don't wish to stereotype, but I think the Linux core development team who built Git in the early 2000s didn't have many women or trans people on it. They were demographically challenged. And Maybe if they'd, had a bit, if they'd had a bit more diversity, if they'd been listening a bit more carefully, they might have realized sometimes people change their names and they want to be able to expunge the previous history of their name and baking unchangeable names into your software might not be such a great idea. So that's just one example of like some of the ways when diversifying your inputs actually can make a big difference. And you can fix that very early on. The problem is now Git has been installed on billions of machines. There are millions of Git repositories in the world. It would be really hard to go back and change this but if they caught it early, it might have been different. So we need to consider safety throughout our designs. We can't bolt it on later. So let's look, to, let's look at some, I wanna show you a few questions, give you a few ideas to start kick you off thinking about some of the things you might ask when you're thinking about user safety. So a good checklist I try to keep when I'm, when I'm doing this is to ask myself questions when I'm building a new feature is to ask things like, could I use this to physically hurt somebody? Am I building something that could be used to physically, physically harm somebody? I don't work with hardware, but if you work with hardware, maybe if you work with medical technology, that might actually be a thing that you think about. Could it be used to emotionally hurt somebody? Pretty much anything with a free text box, because humans will put free text in there and that, some of that text will be upsetting. Could I use it to damage somebody's reputation? The ability for a large mob of users to crowd pile in on somebody and attack them that way? Could I use it to communicate with somebody without their consent? Uh, I was on a plane flight recently and you know they've got those screens in the back of the seats to have like the in-flight entertainment and so on. 
and there was a chat function that allowed me to talk to anybody in the plane. We are in a pressurized metal tube for six hours, and I can send messages to anybody on the plane, and I, they have no way of stopping that. That feels like that could go wrong. So think about that. Another thing to think about, could you, can you use it to show somebody something without their consent? So send them malicious messages, or indeed some of the more insidious things that people send each other, things like pornographic images, insults, Photoshopped images of, of, of you know, very graphic stuff, it's very miserable. Or could you do it to, could you learn something about somebody without their consent, you know, steal data, that sort of thing. Um, so those are some things you, things you need to ask. Very briefly to run through, because I've only got a minute left, some of the things, some of the ways you can mitigate this, some basic mitigations. Ask whether you need to build a feature, because if a feature doesn't exist, I can't use it to harass somebody. Think about ways to reduce interactions between users, so that's giving them blocking functions, muting functionality, or indeed just not offering full text, full text at all. Uh, this is a screenshot from the game Hearthstone. There is no way to send free text to other users. You can just pick one of these pre-canned responses. It's much harder for me to harass somebody or send them rape threats or death threats when the worst thing I can say is threaten. Kind of takes the edge out of it. So have, yes, have a way to ban and block malicious users as well though. Don't keep data you don't need because if you don't have it, you can't, you can't lose it. My ice cream parlor recently to sign up for their loyalty card asked me for my address and my gender. They don't need that information, they just need to know what flavor of ice cream I like. But, and now they don't collect that data, it's harder than to lose it. Be sure that you intervene before, during, and after harassment. Have proactive tools to help users interact with that. Granular access controls. This is one that Facebook actually gets really right. They have lots of, they have lots of ways to change every setting, the privacy of everything. You can even go back and like change, retrospectively change the privacy of a post. So if you publish something, decide you don't want it up there, you can go back and change that. I think granular access control is really important. And actually when you give people granular access controls, they're much more likely to want to interact with your service because they feel much more comfortable with what they're sharing. They can go back, they can change what they're sharing. That, that helps to increase engagement, um, but also just make people feel safer. And finally, hire human moderators and really look after them. Um, there are going to be things in your service where you need to make a judgment about a piece about something and you need, hu you need a human's judgment. You can't solve all this stuff with AI because you don't have the context, you don't have all the information, you don't know about euphemisms. But then look after your moderators as well. This is a really important, this is a really important thing, I think, probably the thing we need to solve as an industry in the next few years. Because if you're a moderator on something like Twitter or Facebook or Reddit, you have to look at the very worst of the human output. You have to look at things like beheading videos, and rape, and torture, and animal harm, and you have to look at this day in, day out, and make an assessment on whether this constitutes a violation of the terms of service. Unless you are Twitter, in which case none of it does. But it's really miserable looking at this stuff, so make sure you're looking after your moderators, make sure you, you're supporting them, make sure they have the psychological support they need, doing what is a fairly unpleasant job. So, in summary, User safety can't be an afterthought. You've got to think about this when you're building your services, when you're building features that allow user to user interaction, when you're building things that might enable people to do harm. And I think if there's, if there's a summary of this, really it's, I want you always to think, how could this be used to hurt somebody when you're building something? How could this be used to hurt somebody? How could an abusive ex weaponize this to hurt their partner? Because if you, don't think about these questions in advance. Somebody is going to answer them for you, and then your users will be hurt as a result. And in five years, and the next time I give this talk, it will be a tweet about your company that I have in the opening example of this presentation. So, assume worst intent, assume somebody will weaponize your software, and try to mitigate that in advance. And on that note, I will finish. Thank you.